Bum 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. Hello and welcome back to Legs Talk About Books, the monthly literature podcast where we talk about books. I'm your host, Hard Leg Joe. Joining me today, CB Radio. Mm-hmm. Also known as Brandon, but not the Brandon we're talking about today. No, today we're talking about Brandon Sanderson, a much fancier man, author of many books, but today's book... The Way of Kings, book one of the Stormlight Archive. Can't get really more fancy than being a king and taking his way. (laughs) That's that's the joke you're going to... Okay, that's That's fine. We're keeping that one in, yeah. Yeah, we're keeping that one in. We always try to be professional for like the first 30 seconds. Because it's it's a literature podcast, it's got to be it's got to be super serious. But but we're also kind of goofy goofballs. Yeah. Hopefully, if you've read along, we join the join the Discord, join the Patreon. We do this every month. It's a fun time. And yeah, if you're you're new to the show, we basically have two sections to this show. Mm-hmm. First, we're gonna give our spoiler free thoughts. If any of you are curious about reading the book and you haven't read it yourself, we'll we'll kind of give you a review. And then after that, we're just going to talk about the book as if you've already read it. We're not going to give a synopsis. If you're looking for that, you'll have to go elsewhere. All we have is is analyzation. Yeah, we we haven't memorized this book that much. (laughs) It's it's a pretty big book. It's a thicken. Um, Not sure if it necessarily had to be this thick. I feel like they might have been able to cut a little bit of the weight out. And to be honest, uh, for my little spoiler-free thoughts on this... I felt the length at points in this book. Yeah, it's, like I said, could have been a little bit shorter. I still think it was worth the read, though. It, it definitely was worth the read. I can see why it has a claim. It has a lot of great parts that we will be talking about later. Some of them didn't pay off as well, and we'll talk about them later. It's clearly set up to be a, a series. Mm-hmm. Like, it does that... I, I think I've talked about this earlier with Game of Thrones... Where it's like, you're spending a lot of time with Jon Snow and the people of Westeros. And then it's like, meanwhile, on the other side of the fucking world, this is happening with Daenerys. That has nothing to do with anything. I believe the term is, uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh, yes, the story is progressing. But let's hold off on that for a moment to talk about this other part of the story that you'll find out later about. The the story is mostly about Kaladin and Dalinar, who are basically in the same part of the setting. Mm -hmm. And then there's another character named Shallon who is on another part of the earth dealing with a completely different problem. And her story only tangentially reacts to anything that this has to do. You're also forgetting about the fourth perspective character, which was the assassin in white, technically. And he's the uh, other perspective character, but he's also very much a interlude character. Yeah, you only get like four chapters with him. I wouldn't really consider him even like a big perspective. I he's not a he's he's more perspective than any of the other rando characters that they talk to. About. Yeah, at least they come back. There's a lot of interludes in between where they do a lot of world building and stuff. Mm-hmm. If you like a big world building story, this this definitely has a lot of it. It has a lot of world building pros and a few world building cons that we'll get into in a bit as well. Oh, when you said pros, I thought you meant pros like P R O S E. No, no, no. Like, like ah, it's written very well. <laughs> uh, I it does have its moments like that, but it, it's its world building has these moments that are really really great, and then there are a lot of head scratching moments that are just like. Why? I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell because we're so early into it and clearly there's more of the world to explore. Mm -hmm. But um, it definitely doesn't rise to the heights of Wheel of Time for me. Granted, that's the best world building I've ever seen. Yeah, and I've got a second that on there. Yeah. So it's not much of an insult to say that, like, this isn't the best world building I've ever read. It's still better than a lot of places. It's better than previously we read on Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn. And yeah. uh, I famously did not really like that one at all for the most... I mean, it was a fun, enjoyable story, but it didn't really... The, the world building didn't do a lot for me. The characters didn't do a lot for me. This is significantly better. This is much more interesting, much more unique, much more exciting. And I could even say the same for, like, I've read the first Dune book, and I feel like the world building on this was slightly better. Yeah. And that's uh, a book famous for, like, its world building. This is also, yeah, Brandon Sanderson, I feel like, 
this book feels like he set up the world and then made the stories in it, which is really good, but it also kind of leaves a few things flapping in the wind for me. Ah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, overall, if I had to give my thoughts, uh, a good book. I don't really give I don't really give scores, but like much better than average. Writing is solid. The characters are excellent and memorable. World building is good enough. Like I said, probably probably better than most stuff that you'll read. But there's still some stuff in there that kind of feels like flaws, and I couldn't get completely invested into it, at least not yet. Um, it also has really solid themes, which it, it brings up some questions and concepts that might actually make you think that could possibly change the way you look at the world. That is one thing One thing I would say in comparison to Brandon Sanderson and Jordan's books. Definitely The Way of Kings' mottos and lessons are much more on its sleeve. It's much more in your face about its philosophy. Mm-hmm. In, in Wheel of Time specifically, one of the things that it kind of leaves out of world building is religion. There's not really a whole lot of it, and even the stuff that is there is pretty oversimplified. Light is good, dark is bad, be a good person. The Way of Kings really kind of brings in, like, philosophy and ethics. They talk about, like, is something good and ethical? Is it possible to have something that's not one and is the other? You're starting to sound a little bit like a dark friend to me. <laughs> Just a little bit more nuanced and stuff like that. Like, I, I personally, I don't think I got anything from it, but I could see how, especially like a younger reader, oh, and yeah. I don't even mean like a kid, I mean like a 20-year-old, 19-year-old, like someone who's who's not read a whole ton of books like like we have, might get a little bit more out of this. I'm sorry, I was struck there for a second by the fact that you just said a 20-year-old is young, and I realized I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to being 30, good sir. Oh, God, it hurts. Yep. Well, you may not have a, a grading system, but we've already established in several of the episodes that I have to have a grading system because <laughs> I've shoehorned myself in here. So I've... I've come up with my my rating for this book, and it is a solid seven heralds out of ten. Seven heralds out of ten? That's what I was looking up in the book. Oh, okay. I'm surprised you, you didn't go higher than seven. You seem like you really, really liked this one. I liked it, but the like it's kind of one of those things like you when you walk out of a movie and you're like, oh, that was really great, and then you watch it again and you're like... The longer you think about it, it's kind of cooled in your mind a little bit. Yeah, you're like, oh, yeah... Yeah, that was kind of (laughs) dumb. Cool, that was cool, but... Yeah, I I would say overall, like, I I, I think this is a really good book from on on almost every, like, technical level. It's just not quite to, like, my tastes. I feel bad not heaping this with praise because it is better than most of the fantasy stuff we've Mm -hmm. read. I would prefer this over, like... Discworld, even with all its its humor and everything that it's put in there. I would prefer this more than Furies of Calderon. I'd definitely put it over that, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just really kind of not my taste. Like I said, it, it, it has a really modern feel to it. If I think that's the word. Like, the fights remind me a lot of, like, anime and video games. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, like, people do these long dashes and then slide dramatically along the ground. There's lots of, like, mowing down of generic NPCs en masse and just being a badass. A lot of jumping and flips and stuff. And for me, it's the it's some of that and some of the more of, like, the characters have this kind of more modern take on their personalities and such. And though that's really cool... I do yearn for some of your more classic heroes and your more, like, I, I, I don't need to know about their dark past. I would really <laughs> like to learn them being the best that they are now. I, I, I do like the more complex characters. That's one of the modern things that I really enjoy, actually. It's mostly the fights and then this sort of, um, I feel almost like the story has mystery box style writing. If you're familiar with J.J. Abrams... Um, at the director, he's he's done a famous TED talk where he talks about writing a story in terms of you have a mystery and you never tell people what it is. They open the box and they find another box, another mystery, maybe several more mysteries to sort of keep them going. It could even be a boat. It could even be a boat. Yes, we're adding the really old Family Guy quotes <laughs> in here. Yeah, I mean, those kids will get it. 
the kids will get yeah. um and, and like not not just um i guess i'd call it mystery box but it also has this feel almost like it was written for the audience of game theory yeah it's it's purposely kept vague and mysterious so that people will theorize about it so that people will try to draw lines and then figure out if they're right i think a great way of, of honing that down is it's not so much the mystery it's the predatory nature of the mystery is a lot more blatant i'm not even sure if i'd call it predatory because it's like people a lot of people really like that style of writing it's these days media like because you can talk with people all over the world any media that isn't super super complex is going to get like spoiled almost immediately yes it's going to be like people will be pointing out plot holes people will be finding stuff out so you kind of need in the modern day to make your story this really complex, almost overwrought thing full of pages and pages and pages of lore. Mm -hmm. And then you have to like dole it out in little tea teaspoon sized bites. Dumbledore was gay. <laughs> I'm not sure if that has anything to do with anything. No, that's kind of like what I'm seeing on this, like the, the tiny, tiny bites to just be like, here's the little parts of the information about the universe so that you get... You just keep buying into the interest of it as opposed to letting the actual world breathe and make you feel like you're interested. Yeah, it's, it's less that. It's it's more that, like, um, I don't feel like I'm being told a story. I feel almost like I'm being given homework yes. in some, some ways. I, I think the best way that I would explain it is... You know, when you when you read Wheel of Time, the, mm -hmm. the cool thing about it is that, like, in the first story, you think you understand what wizards are. Yes. You think you understand how magic works. You think you do. Because, yeah, ev everyone thinks... that That's how the world works, right? Like, mm -hmm. everyone thinks they have an understanding of, like, what World War I was or, like, what the Civil War was. And then if you go and look at it in, in depth, you find there's more nuance to it. There's more interesting things to explore. And that's how reading Wheel of Time feels. You never feel lost. You never feel like you need to try to understand things. You feel like you know it. And then it's always a surprise when you learn more. Yeah. In, in the Stormlight Chronicle, it feels like things are being withheld from you in order to, like, carrot on the stick. Like, to keep you moving forward. Almost, uh, like, manipulation. It's the difference between, like... A magic eye and a where's Waldo, essentially. Because a magic eye, it's like, look harder. You might be able to see it. Where's Waldo? You're like, oh, I found Waldo. But look at all this crap that's going on yeah. in the background. Even if you don't find Waldo, you still got a cool image to look at. With yeah. A lot of unique little things you can find. Um, so yeah, I guess if, if that would be my my recommendation, would be, do you, if you like fantasy... I'd almost say this is like a must read. Mm. This is some of the best fantasy I've read. Just be aware going in. It's kind of modern. It kind of leads into these, again, almost anime video game style fight scenes, as well as th this mystery box style of trying to build up all this intrigue. And if you just want a story told to you with compelling characters, this still has it, but it also has that other stuff added in. Yes. I guess that, that is one thing I should make clear. Like, I want to read the next story, and not because I care about the mystery, but because I want to see what happens to Kaladin. Same here. And Dalinar. I'm actually wanting to read the story simply because of the ramifications that have happened at the end of this book. Just, it's not so much of the, uh, the mystery of what's happening, the mystery of what's going to happen with these people. And what's, yeah. like, how they're going to react and, and bounce off of each other in these uh, in this I guess, response. I guess that's why I'm, like, kind of pushing against th this whole idea is because it feels like it's unneeded. Because mm -hmm. the characters in the story are already really compelling and you don't need all that other stuff. Yeah, it, again, it's, it's, it's garnish on top of a really good steak. You don't need it. Yeah, it, it reminds me there's, um, without spoilers... There's a, there, near the end, there's like a fight scene, and then afterwards there's a really good character element. Mm -hmm. And the fight scene did almost nothing for me, and the big character building element was the thing that like truly moved me. To the point that it almost feels like tacked on, where he was like, yeah, this is the climax, and people want to see a bunch of guys flipping around and doing sword shit, mm -hmm. so I gotta throw that in. And it's like, I, I don't think you need to do that, buddy. Nope. I think your story would have been good, better without it. <laughs> but yeah, uh... TLDR, we liked this book. 
Um, it was a great book, probably one of the the best ones we've the best fantasy ones we've read here. Yeah, it's it's definitely not going to be on our low tier, and as much as much as we've dumped on it a little bit in the last few minutes. But it, it's not flawless. We will point out the flaws and everything like that. But if we do continue a series, it will probably be this one, unless we come across something that we like even more. Yeah, this is probably going to be the one after we've knocked out Wheel of Time in 2024. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, we've got six more books to go. Six more books. That's a long series. To be fair, though, Stormlight Archive is only on its fourth book, and uh, Brandon Sanderson has said there will be ten. I kind of don't like starting a series where it's not finished yet, because there's always that, that worry that it won't get finished. And yet you read Game of Thrones. I stopped. <laughs> I stopped after I like I read the first two books and then realized that the sixth one still wasn't out or even had like a, a announcement date I'm and that still, the series was gonna finish before it did. I'm still waiting for my t- third Kingslayer, Robert. Patrick <laughs> Rothfuss, you reading this, you listening to this, where's my fucking third book? I want it. Yeah. What was it? The King Killer Chronicles? King, King Slayer, I believe. King Slayer. Yeah. I thought it was King Killer. Either King way, yeah, that, that that was another one where it's like I would read the second book. If I was sure the third book would exist. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten off topic. Let's get on topic with the way of Kings. Heavy spoilers from this point on. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and jump into the discussion points. And like I said before, we're just going to assume either you've already read this or you're not going to be reading it. We're not really into synopses here. We're not going to go blow by blow or whatever. First in the book. So (laughs) if if you're lost, that's your problem, fucko. (laughs) We need to come. We still need to come up with a name for our like audience, like what we should call them. Yeah. How you guys want to be called, fuckos? Let's not. <laughs> let's uh... just imagine the merchandise we won't be able to wear in public. <laughs> How about book bimbos? Let's go for that. <laughs> that makes it sound like we read a different kind of literature. <laughs> I like literature, but not that way. So to start off with, before we get into the the hardcore themes and everything, Mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk about the the world building in general and a couple little nitpicky things I had. Let's start with some of the highs. Yeah, well, I mean, the highs are pretty much everything about it. It's I love that he's made a completely alien world Mm -hmm. with, like, all this flora and fauna that's clearly designed to survive the high storms. And even though I didn't really... I went audiobook, he went uh, with actual book, like we said. So you didn't get all the pictures. I didn't get all the pictures, but I could still clearly picture some of the places, like the Shattered Plains had a really good idea on that one. Yeah. But even then, like, I I can appreciate just how interesting, like, the the grass and the, the crustacean creatures that were the main predominant form fa- of life fauna, I yeah. say, is was really, really interesting and, and compelling, and I liked that. It's it's very unique. It's it's something I haven't seen before, and I'm curious to, to explore the rest of the world to see what other kind of stuff they have there. But Brandon Sanderson was also smart enough to realize that you can't have a civilization without chickens. <laughs> you can't build a civilization without chickens. As a man who loves chicken too much, you can't. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where I remember reading this, and then they get to the part where the, the soldiers have horses, and it's like... Ding, 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 what? Well, it, it, my first thing, my first immediate thought was like, what? Horses can survive here? And then I went back and looked at the map, because there's a map on the at the beginning, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at Roshar, and I'm like, okay, all the storms come from east to west. We already had the interlude period where it talks about, like, Oh, this far from the coast, the storms aren't that bad. You can ride out a high storm, like, in the open water, as long as you have, like, a rock to huddle against. Mm-hmm. And and then you see Shinover, which is just, or Shinovar, I don't know exactly. Shinovar. Shinovar, which is just shielded by the mountains. And it's like, okay, so anything there would be normal, it would be able to grow. I did enjoy the little interlude that they had in there of the uh, girl merchant who was just like, Wow, the trees, it's so eerie here. Nothing moves. Yeah, it's this grass is dumb. It doesn't hide. <laughs> and I'm just, just like, that's kind of cool to do that. But then it's also this very... Uh, it's its cool to do. I like it. What I don't like is all the stuff in Shinovar is exactly Earth stuff. Yes. It, like, this is clearly not Earth. This is not Earth like a million years from now. They've set up that it's like, it's smaller than Earth. It has slightly less gravity it does not follow our history. 
there should not be horses and chickens. Mm-hmm. There should be like mammals that are able to survive outside the high storms. Maybe something like a horse that you can ride and mount and is very powerful. Hell, make it look like Slipnir, you know, like six legs. Make it a you don't have to make it a four legged beast of burden. You could have made it a a, a big old bear that mom. That... You could have you could have had war bears. <laughs> You could have had Dalinar riding it on shard plate with a fucking, like, bear that runs as fast as a horse. And instead, he just sort of decided to... It, it, again, it feels kind of lazy. Maybe there's an explanation in the further stuff. Maybe humans seeded this area. Or maybe horses aren't exactly what we think. Maybe what they call a horse is actually somewhat different. Mm-hmm. But we know it's a four, it's a four-legged mammal that has hooves that you wear saddles and stuff for. And it's like, you could have had a bison, you could have had a bear, you could have had a lot of other cool stuff, and you just went for, like, the standard fantasy stuff. It is very jarring and weird to to see Earth-like creatures in that world. And Not even Earth-like, like, like exactly just, Earth. Just like, yeah, just a it, slip it, it of just, Earth. Just, it, it strikes me as, like, going to Vulcan... And yeah, you're going to meet humanoids with very slight differences, but you're not going to run into, like, a, an actual chicken. Mm-hmm. You might have, they might have fowl that they eat, and maybe it's, like, slightly different, like, at least make it different colored or something. I don't, I don't know. Like, if they had horses, but they were, like, red, like, bright, fiery red, and they had slightly longer tails or maybe sharp teeth, they were, like, carnivorous horses. Oh, God, that's terrifying. Stop. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> like, that would have been, like, the horse eats meat. You couldn't, it just, it's so weird. It sticks out because everything else about this is like, I've made a completely original biology. And then the knights just ride horses into battle. It it feels kind of like he got like all the way done with 90% of the world. And he was just like, oh, that was a hard weekend. Uh, This little slip here. uh, It doesn't, it's not hit by the storms. Uh... It's got horses and chickens. It's it's, it's yeah, just horse. I don't know the way the way Shinovar is like shaped. It almost feels like he came up. He really wanted horses because <laughs> he just likes horses, and then he had to like build the world. He's like, what if there's a little section right here that's t- like, <laughs> and oh, we'll just, just put all the mountains in front of it. They'll survive. <laughs> it'll 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 be fine. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that's like a little nitpick. It, it, again, though, it's it doesn't take anything down. It's just, it sticks out when everything else is so different. Yeah, it's a... Um, and then the other, there's there's two other things that, like, no matter how they tried to explain it, I just couldn't quite get into it. The one is they have, they have spherical money. Yeah. Not that... only do they have spherical money, they have spherical money that serves a practical purpose to the point where you have to decide if you're going to have light or money. <laughs> I, until you said it was spherical, I didn't really think about it. For me, my main issue with it is, he made the money too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't just make it so that it was, because there's four different shapes, and then there's four different colors. And if you look at money, there's there's coins, and then there's paper. And that's it. You don't have four different kinds of coins, and four different kinds of paper, and then it's, I mean, we do have four different kinds of coins. But it, it it feels overly complicated. It feels overly complicated, but, like, if I was going to complain about this, I wanted to look up, like, I spent time looking at the history of money. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you see early British money, you know that people can make shit very, very complicated for no fucking reason. That doesn't surprise me. It just surprises me the fact that, like, you would use balls for money. It's like, they can roll away. They could. They talk about, like... Oh, we put the flat side. There's a there's a little bit of a flat side, so you could set it on a table. Like, yeah, but any ro- any wobbling, like say in a high storm, mm-hmm. would would send it over. And the the thing is, the money itself is the gems. They just encase them in a sphere of glass. And it's like you could have put the gems in like a square cube that would have been able to, to sit and stack, just like kind of real money. You could have put it in a coin shape, more like a cylinder. That's actually something you could have just about. you could have just set the chips and have people trade those, um, and it really just comes down to I think aesthetically he wanted people to be able to hold balls of glowing stuff, and he didn't think about how practical that would be. And we did talk about this money thing a while back, and you're talking also about like every form of currency has pretty much been able to be stacked. It, it... pretty much either stacked or um. I, I was actually, this is a little bit of trivia for you. For a short period in China, 
they had money that was shaped like knives. They had knife money. And um, the interesting thing about that is that they basically put holes in the ends of the, uh, the hilts mm-hmm. so you could thread them through a piece of string. So people would wear, like, necklaces or have, like, a bandolier of this knife-shaped money. But the thing is, looking it up, like, these knives, they weren't sharpened. Mm-hmm. Um, because they were made out of, like, gold and stuff. And yeah. gold is an awful thing to make a sword out of. It bends really easily. It's soft and malleable at room temperature. Yeah, it's not really the best thing. So that, that that's the other thing that really strikes me, is that, like, you would take anything practical and mm-hmm. make that into money. Because... You know, people have bartered with food and stuff, but I can find no evidence of anyone using, like, anything that can actually be used as money. Because it comes up with the... And this they actually have this in the book, where it's like, I need to spend this money on your education, but also it's the light we need in the surgery room, and without it we can't see. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why would you use lights as money? Why would you... It's just weird. Actually, in the first scene in the book, or second scene, sorry, you see that they have them in sconces just sitting above where anybody could just literally, like, hoop shot, take a little, like, orb out and be like, oh, I got 50 bucks out of you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to be fair, there have been castles that have put, like, gold ornations and stuff on the, on the walls. They assume that people, like, servants aren't going to pry that out, or if they can, they'll find where you are and they'll cut your hands off or something like that. But still, like, the idea of it being in... When I'm thinking sconces, I'm not thinking, like, oh, there's a little thing every... I'm expecting, like, two row, two row, two row. There's a lot of it. Yeah. They just line the walls with money. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, this is incredibly impractical. Yeah. It's just really weird, and it I, I don't think there's anything to it, because it's like, the story kind of demands that the characters need to have access to Stormlight, mm-hmm. and the only reason they would be given it is if it was money. And, I mean, I guess that still doesn't, like, it could have still been coins or something, but it's just not quite as dramatic to have, like, Kaladin on the roof, desperately clutching, like, a block. <laughs> Actually, Joe, I really realize now why. Because you're literally uh, raging against a fantasy story that uses capitalism as power. (laughs) That's that's everything. Money is the power. Money is the power, exactly. Yeah, and the other, I feel like we're spending so much time on this. It really doesn't matter all that much. It's just one of these things that, like, I wanted to talk about because it it bothered me throughout the whole book. And the the other one is more cultural world building. It has to do with the whole safe hand thing. Yeah. Where it's like, they have this really strange idea of modesty. Where women, one of their hands is sort of like a private thing to be shared with your husband. And they wear a long sleeve. And it's like, don't get me wrong. Throughout throughout history, women have been shamed over almost every part of their body. From like their hair to their lips, feet in some societies, midriff. Like, doesn't matter what it is. But what strikes me about it is that you would pick one hand and say that it's immodest when your hands are symmetrical. Mm. Like, your left hand is no different from your right hand. Like, it looks the same. And, like, I I understand people are going to talk about, like, oh, you know, Catholics, they they thought left-handedness was bad. So it's like, I get people making a difference. But it's just that I that visual idea of hiding the hands when they're the same. There's a big difference between, yeah, like not using to hiding completely for no adequately explained reason. Yeah, especially just like with a glove. And it's like you can see just the outline of it. And also to, to offset this little like shit post we're throwing down <laughs> on this one. The he also has this weird cultural thing of women are the only ones that can read as opposed to men, which is a bit of a hindrance, but it also kind of makes a social sense. Yeah, that that one, it seemed a little weird at first that, like, only women are allowed to read, and I'm like, I hope I hope no one has to, like, look at a map or something. Mm. <laughs> or, like, how do they know what the street signs are? That seems very impractical. Mm. But then I remember mm. that, like, for large periods of our, our history, it was like, cooking is a womanly skill, and it's like, what did you do if you had to eat and you were mm. a guy and there's no woman about? <laughs> like, yeah. What did you do? Like, we've done just as stupid stuff, so I'm willing to let that pass. Yeah. Plus, they have glyphs. Yeah, it, it, I, it is very, it felt very clunky at first, like you said. But then then the more I thought about it, the, the better it felt. Uh, and it kind of awkward, but it's it was really also awesome to see it from other 
uh, civilization's perspective. Yeah, I like that they set up in like one of Shalon's early chapters where like she's like, I think the captain can read, but I'm willing to look past that debased heresy. It's not appropriate, but I guess it's all right. You get this idea that like, even though we don't see the other civilizations here, that a lot of them are much more lax about Voronism. Mm-hmm. Where they're like, yeah, you're supposed to cover up your left hand, but like, as long as you're not flaunting it or anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to have to wear the big old stupid sleeve. I'll wear a glove. It'll be fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll not, I don't want to wear anything, but I'll just keep my hand in my pocket most, unless I need to do something. I'll just look like a smooth criminal. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of those things where it's like, they, you've learned to do a surprising amount of things, like, through a sleeve. Yes. But I guess, like, I've, I've done... At pretty much everything through <laughs> that sounds i've done everything through a sleeve <laughs> like everything Fine. but no I, I remember being cold at like school and having a sweater and just pulling the sleeves over my hands and like writing with a pencil that way so yeah. it's like yeah i could i could understand being an artist or anything even through the sleeve yeah, but i think we've talked enough about the cultural uh, it, it's so weird buildings. because again i want to stress this this doesn't impact the story that much it's just fun to talk about. It's yeah. just goofy, goofy little nitpicky shit that I'm like, how are you doing that? <laughs> and don't get me started on Spren either. Oh, God. I no. mean, granted, they're going to explain, though, they're already setting up that there's more to them, but um, I just kept expecting where it's like, you you know, two guys are chilling out in an elevator and suddenly fart Spren start walking <laughs> out of the walls. Or like, you know, two guys are like, you're reading over a book and suddenly, like, sexual tension spread and start rising. <laughs> like, are spread just for everything? I this, do, this could make this could make society really awkward. <laughs> I do really like the the two monks sp- uh, that were like studying spread. Yeah, that was really cool because that was just this idea of like, what the hell are spread? Do they even know? And nobody, yeah. and nobody really has a good understanding. But these two like old monks are just kind of like, you know what? We're just going to, like, study a spread. Just... We're going to try to measure them and their brightness and their luminance. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they basically act in the, the same way that uh, light particles do, where once you measure them, it fixes them in place. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Let's not get too hard into physics here. <laughs> <clears throat> Quantum physics, Shush even. Shush it. All right. But let's get into the things that actually impact the story. Yeah. Go for it. Your, right. your topic, buddy. My what do you top- want to say? I'll be silent for like a minute. I didn't actually mean to say silent, but okay. The story dealing with Shallan, we'll start with a little bit thinner things here, is really, really good at displaying a character's repression of a traumatic event. It's a character's complete avoidance of this information. Because every time it pops into her brain, she literally tries to go tell anything else. And it's, I think it's a really interesting way of displaying a character's just... Lack of... Inability to cope. Inability to cope. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. And, yeah, I thought that was a really cool way. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I, I've seen kind of stuff... The, to me, the, the high bar for that is Slaughterhouse-Five. Oh. Where you and I couldn't even... Like, you were like, wait, he's coping with, with PTSD after the war? I thought he was actually talking to aliens and stuff. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's the best kind of cope. Where even they don't know that they're coping. This one seems a little obvious by by contrast. But that she's not the main crux of the story. She's one of three. Yeah. So. She's one of three and the one that doesn't doesn't have much to do with anything. Yeah, I mean she has a great background character that somehow has full on stuff. And yes, as our listeners uh, did say in the Twitter uh, Shalon, I'm sure, gets better, but as of right now Oh she, yeah, that's she, what you were talking about. As of right now, she is just uh, I didn't write down who it was, but there was someone who was like, make sure you tell the audience that Shallan gets better in the future, in the future episodes. Mm-hmm. I've not, I've not, have you looked at the titles of any of them? No. I'm pretty sure she's like running around on the title with like a shard blade or something. No, I've seen that. I've seen the title picture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's her with like a shard blade. So I assume she becomes much more significant in the, in the, in the future what? chapters. But in this one, yeah, she's just like, she's the meanwhile on the other end of the world. She actually does, in this book, already still have a shard blade. She never pulls it out. You you contend that, like, at this point, she she talks about ten heartbeats anytime in they talk one about sentence. Heart, that, anytime they talk about ten heartbeats, that means that they're pulling out a shard blade. I mean, we'll, I, it, we'll speak of this later. Again, it again, it's it's a mystery box thing. Like, yeah. yeah, you can look back to that point and be like, aha, they, that proves it. To me, it's like, 
I, mean, I don't care either way. They didn't, didn't really have anything to do with anything. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if anything, I'm like, if you had a shard blade and you didn't pick it out when there were, like, literal monsters chasing you, or when you thought you were going to die in that alleyway, like, what, what do you, how did you get this? Why are you doing it? I, no, she was actually going to summon it against those weird things that were chasing Yeah, I don't her. know why she didn't. That was, like, some horror movie shit. Yeah. I it's mean, like you're drawing pictures and they're appearing just in the pictures. But you're also talking about horror movies that they don't have. I know. That's the thing. Like, I recognize that from a horror movie. She's just experiencing it for the first time, which would make it even more terrifying. I think she just thought she was having a psychotic break, which is great because she's under a lot of stress. Possibly. But there are some other points that you wanted to start off on. Well, I, th- I feel like uh, I-, I wanted to talk more in depth about the mystery box stuff, but I feel like I, I accidentally went off the rails a little bit uh, it- when I- we were doing the review about all that. And it's it-, it I guess the reason I dislike it again, there's there's the idea that, like, I don't think it was really all that needed. It feels kind of tacked on. This book feels a little too long as is. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is just sort of like setting up stuff that is clearly there to hint at stuff that's going to be there in the future. But not actually doing it. Especially with Shallan. Shallan's entire story is like, her dad is dead and he was this mysterious guy. You know nothing about him, but you learn that she killed him. What? How did that happen? You gotta, you gotta find the new mystery box. Oh, she's being stalked by these mysterious creatures. She's going into the Sea of Beads. She can uh, transmute or whatever the hell they call it without using a uh, glove thing. <laughs> Again, soulcaster. soulcaster. She could soulcast without a soulcaster. You've set up all these things, and it's you've given me very little reason to care about any of it. Yeah, fair point. Like, yeah, like the one guy said, I, I'm sure it gets more interesting, but it feels like it it would, didn't have to be in this book. Mm-hmm. You could have just had it be about Kaladin and Dalinar, and the two of them have this really good setup where they're dealing with the same situation, but one person is at the very bottom drecks of society, literally a slave whose life is worthless, who's being sent to die, mm-hmm. versus the king who, or not the king, but um, a, a major general mm. who is sending people to die and having to make these difficult situations for the sake of the bigger picture. Like, that that relationship was awesome, and I don't know why they had to interrupt it with a, a girl studying and dealing with supernatural threats because everybody likes a good bookworm (laughs) i suppose she was all right and yeah that the mystery box with brandon sanderson i think it'll pay off i think he's setting up stuff that he's going to resolve Mm -hmm. but i'm so jaded from this style of of writing oh yeah this is i'm so cynical about them being able to do it that like i can't get excited about it again for me it's because it feels predatory it it I understand that you're trying to sell your story and you're trying to sell your book, but sell it on the merit of the story. Don't sell it on the mystery unless it is an actual mystery. Yeah. That's why I call it predatory. It's very much like... It it does sort of have that like negative reinforcement where they're like, I'm going to play the first three notes of a song and then leave the third one off. You'll get that in the second book. You gotta make sure to go read that. It play, it plays definitely heavily into the FOMO, like fear of missing out. Yeah. Like, I didn't catch that. I need to get the book and read that. Like, oh, great. No, you should. Yeah. But again, like, that's that's just how society is, unfortunately, at the moment. You got, people gotta make money. You gotta, gotta make your books and you gotta get that hook. Mm-hmm. You gotta get the hooks in there. You just write for the sheer enjoyment of the writing of yeah, that that would be nice if it, you gotta put bread on the table. <laughs> then don't eat bread. Then don't eat bread. Bread is expensive. No, it's actually pretty cheap. Why are we talking? Uh, anyway. <laughs> eat turnip. Turnip is strong rooted fruit. The story goes out of its way. <laughs> we're we're laughing because the sudden sudden trend. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. The story goes out of its way to make the point that uh, the journey is more important than the destination. Mm-hmm. There's there's actually a line on the back of the book, which I gave to Brandon, and then he set it down behind him, so I can't actually see it. Life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. That's the credo of the Knights Radiant, and it sounds kind of silly at first, but they actually go out of their way to explain it, and they do it in a way that hits home better than 
most of the times I've seen that done. Mm-hmm. Which I always love to point out in stories. Like, I think I talked about Wheel of Time, book six does, like, a cliche I've seen a million times, but it does it the first time effectively. Where I was like, oh, that's what everyone else was trying to do and failed to do. I like to think of it as teaching a new dog old tricks. Yeah, like, pretty much. Where they make it like, I've, I've heard the, the journey comes before destination, or the journey is more important than the destination, like, a million times. And usually it's kind of phrased in terms of, like, oh, you had to go find a jewel to save the town, but you ended up meeting a lovely princess and exploring all the lands, and even if you didn't get the jewel, it wasn't the adventure worth it. It's like, well, not to the people back in the town who need the jewel to live. Yeah, they, they don't really care about your journey. The, the destination is kind of important. But this this makes it a little less about, like, the tangible goals mm-hmm. and more about, like, how you live your life. Like, when it says the journey, it means your journey through life. How you lead your life is more important than how you end your life. Like, you know, you could die the super rich man in the world. That's not going to help you. What matters is how did you earn those riches. And I actually, uh, for me, it was the strength before weakness. And the idea that uh, you should have the strong protecting the weak is not a new concept. It's sadly one that we don't do as much, but yeah. Um, It does make the good point that, like, everyone is going to be strong at some point, and then they will be weak. mm -hmm. And so it's like, use the strength while you have it to protect the weak, because one day you will be the weak. I love how it frames it in the story, how it actually builds up to telling that point, though with Kaladin specifically because he is he starts off as strong at the beginning very strong and you're very like oh impressed and then he's immediately brought weak and you see him struggling with this you see him go through this dark uh, dark night of the soul throughout most of the book is actually his dark night of the soul it's very like i am shit and i caused the death of everyone around me and really my, I've failed at everything. I've failed at everything. I am weakness. I shouldn't even try. And then he just starts slowly budding from that and realizing the strength that he always had and realizing that that strength should be used to protect the people that he sees in their weakness as the same as he was. And yeah. just to try and reinforce that, you know, like his dad has this really great line that I that actually rings in me more than this will ever and it's this line of, because somebody has to do it first. Someone has to start, I think it mm-hmm. was. Someone has to start doing the right thing. Even and- when people are being bad. You have to give trust to someone. Um, it, it, as silly as it sounds, it's the old Family Guy Spider-Man mm-hmm. thing. Like, everybody gets one. I apply that to, like, everything. Like, everyone starts with my trust. The, the idea that trust has to be earned, I think is... It, it, it's what leads us into this, like, what are you going to do for me? Mm-hmm. You've got to be like, I'm willing to put my faith that you will do the right thing, and I hope that you'll repay me. Because if we go through this life distrusting each other and only looking out for what we're going to get, then you end up like Saldeus. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah, it, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, that dude's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But yeah, it, it, it is really interesting. Where it's like I remember reading that on the back and thinking that was a really silly saying and a really aw- odd way to say it. Mm-hmm. And um, I still feel that way. I, <laughs> I still don't really, like, I'm not going to, like, chant it dramatically. But I understand it now. And I, I do have to give him some, kind of some credit for being able to describe such a high-minded idea in three words. Uh, no, yeah, it takes definitely some skill to narrow a a life mantra down into just four sentences. Yeah. Or three sentences. Three sentences. Although, it ha- again, the, the thing is, if you read it on your own, it's y- you have to have it explained to you mm-hmm. in order to understand the full weight of it. And it's like, I feel like that's the weakness. Like, what's the point of shortening something if you have to explain it anyway? Yeah, it's a hook. Yeah, I guess it's the same for, like, a lot of, like, when you talk about, like, defund the police. And people are like, what? That doesn't... How how are we going to protect laws? Like, we're still going to have law enforcement. You have to, like, explain that we're still going to do stuff. We just want the current police to be 
um, to lower the funding that they use for like excessive weapons and put mm. that into community projects. It's it's like a three word statement that you then have to spend f- uh, two paragraphs explaining what it actually means. But that those three words get your attention because you're like, what? You can't do that. It's like, aha! But actually, <laughs> but strength before weakness. <laughs> strength, well, duh. I think that that's the one. He's like, life before death, and he's like, well, yeah. yeah. You gotta mm-hmm. live before you die. You don't die first. What the hell kind of statement is that? And then mm-hmm. someone has to explain. Yeah. But yeah, I guess moving on to the other other point we had here. This is something I don't have a whole lot to say about it, but I just thought it was interesting because this is the the first fantasy story I've ever read that has like an explicitly atheist character. Yeah, yeah. Who's just like, no, I I don't believe in any of the religions. I think there's a scientific explanation for the things that we think are gods Mm -hmm. i don't think they're actually gods i think they're just like higher beings that had access to some sort of technology or biologically superior to us in some way and we thought they were gods which is like surprisingly reasonable even when i see it in in regular fictions it's usually just like oh my puppy died so god has abandoned me yeah it's like this really edgy teenager understanding of atheism Mm -hmm. and this was very like she even has there's a point where uh the king is like well how do you get morality if you don't have a god to tell you what's good and she kind of explains this idea of like i have axioms that i hold on faith that don't come from god i can decide that they're they're good or bad or whatever just because millions of people believe them doesn't mean they're right because of that because millions of people could be wrong and i'm like that's Okay, touche. She didn't really play a big role in the story, though. And, and I know you hated her. <laughs> I, I, you, you took out my, my punch on that. <laughs> I was going to be like, yes, I see that you find her very fascinating. I found her to be a huge bitch. <laughs> like, I, it's not even like I, I am a man of faith. And yeah, uh, an atheist uh, does Those sometimes kind of rub you the, the wrong, wrong way. way. You actually took the words right out of my head. Sorry. Um, the, but... It's not that. It's just her overall, like, demeanor is very, very just, like, confrontational. And it's it that rubs me the most the wrong way. I mean, the, the thing about me is that, like, it seems almost like she's always trying to do her own thing and it's other people who confront her. Like, she doesn't go around trying to convert anyone or, like, again, it, the, the king asks her about morality. She doesn't go around preaching it. But if people come to her and they're like, I'm curious about your beliefs, tell me this thing, she will explain it to them. Mm-hmm. But it's not that, again. It's kind of her very standoffish personality. And it actually still shows even without faith in that because she doesn't trust Shalon and doesn't even care to do anything until she actually attempts to take uh, fake take her own life. Then uh, Sh- uh, Yasna actually gets off of her bitch horse and (laughs) decides to step down for a moment there and then is really immediately reaffirmed in her belief that other people are not to be trusted five seconds later by being like, oh, she stole my soul caster. Oh, I don't trust you anymore. Yeah. It's, it's this, that character flaw that is very much my like main problem with her is that she doesn't, uh, the people that she trusts are family and that is it. And that's not a bad thing, but she doesn't even give those other people, like, the benefit of the doubt. I'm curious, because you you listened to the audiobook, if, like, anything about the, the tone that the actor used or actress. Um, I don't think so. It may have been a bit of the tone. She was very dry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there was only, like, a couple of characters that were female-voiced in that, because, again, it was primarily Dalinar and... Kaladin. Kaladin. And and one's leading in the army, and the other one is in the, the slave pits. And in both cases, it's all men. Yeah. Manly men everywhere. Men and greasy men, and men and more greasy men. And then there was just the one the one guy's aunt. Yeah. Dalinar's love interest, whose name I barely remember. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, it's, it was primarily uh, male voice acting, but there was a few. That, yeah. Uh, it was so I, I'm curious to what, what the rest of you thought, because... You know, to me, Yasna is almost like a non-character in this because she's not a perspective character. Mm-hmm. And even even when she's involved, 
you don't really care about what her goals are, or what she's doing. She's only really important in relation to Shallan. Like, she's a, a goal for Shallan to overcome mm-hmm. more than anything. So to me, it's like, I almost saw her as like a prop. And anything that like, uh, she's, she, she does one really questionable thing. Uh, okay, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 mm. She does one super questionable thing where, um... Thank you for adding super. <laughs> where, where, like, I'm like, hmm, I, I'm kind of questioning her motives, but if, if Wheel of Time has taught me one thing, it's to not judge a character until you get a perspective on from them. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really curious to see, like, what her mind is like. Because especially, like, in the case of Kaladin, mm. they make a point of, like, you know, Kaladin spends the entire thing feeling like he's cursed, feeling like he's shit, feeling as though he can't help everything, the situation is helpless, and it's obvious to his men that they don't see that. Yes. He always puts on a tough face. Dalinar often tries to do the same thing. If anything, he, he sort of, like, part of his story arc is learning to, like, we can be more open about what we're feeling without you know, being cowards it's or whatever. O- it's okay to cry down right? <laughs> It's okay. okay from time to time. So, you know, I'm not going to super harshly judge Yashna because I don't know what her backstory is. I don't know what her thought process is. Who knows? Maybe she's like having, maybe maybe after she did the, 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 the super questionable thing. I don't know why I'm hiding it like we're unspoiled. After she killed all those dudes, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe she feels really bad about it. No, she doesn't. You don't know that. No, she said it. Uh, yeah, but pe- people can lie, Brandon. I'm not yeah, sure if yeah. you're aware of that. The king seems... No, 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 no. Let's go back to this. People can lie? What? Huh? Because that, that, that's the other thing that struck me. is um, I remember especially around that part, you were like, she does a thing that's absolutely awful. And then I got to the end of the book and I'm like, you know, the king is bleeding people to death. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, on no. mass. That he was, uh, he was even more of a background character. You only get like two conversations with him, and then he's gone. Yeah. And every time he seems like this dopey kind of whoop, boy, dopey. He's kind of aloof, but he's known for having these big hospitals, and he always visits the hospitals. Mm-hmm. And he I, seems like such a nice guy. And then you find, and he's still being a nice guy, but for all, <laughs> well, like he's <laughs> he's still being a, a good ish. Guy, he's doing it for the good of, of other people. But he's doing completely the wrong things. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to say. Someone asked us to talk about the death rattles, the uh, the statements from all the people dying that you... That, like, every chapter kind of starts with a statement, some weird prophecy, and then a note about, like, who said it and how, how many seconds away from death they were. And you don't find until, like, the last couple chapters that it's from the king's hospital where he is bleeding people out specifically to hear the prophecies that people whisper seconds before they die. Mm-hmm. Because apparently this is a, a, a thing that has been happening for a while and is hinting at some future catastrophe he na- needs to know about. And I thought it was a really good framing device. It was really cool. But, yeah, finding that out about the king, I, it immediately went from being like, oh, he's a big dopey guy. And I, wow, man, this dude's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> So you got it. Uh, th- that's the thing is like we don't know if if it turns out that the things he's doing, that the death rattles, the information he gets from them mm. is critical to saving every life on Earth. And it's like, was he justified in bleeding people to death if that was the only way to do it? He also had the hospital that did legitimately help people. It's not like everyone who goes in never checks out or anything. Yeah, I mean that'd be a very bad marketing plan. But yeah, <laughs> come to our hospital. Come out. Never. Never. <laughs> yeah, or it's kind of like this. I, I feel like a lot of people are willing to give um, Shen or Zhen. What's his name? Shen. Shen. I feel like a lot of people are willing to give him crap because he goes on and on about how bad he feels about killing people. I was like, bitch, you're still killing people by the hundreds. Like, serious. Like, you. the only thing stopping you is, like, pride. It's like, you know pride ain't real, right? Like, you can, you can ignore that shit. Actually, it's this whole, like, ingrained honor system in his head. But yeah. Yeah. It's still, it's like, you know, what's more important, your honor system or the lives of hundreds of innocent people? Mm. Apparently to him, the honor system, which I'm like, I disagree. <laughs> well, you also were brought up on a very different system. Yeah. So it's it's a very strange cultural thing. Like, again, we didn't get to talk about the Shinovarian people, but their, inter- their culture system is 
very fascinating. It's actually and, more fascinating than anybody else. But it's, again, it struck me as so weird that you were bothered by her bitchiness or her murdering someone, when I don't think there's a single character in this story who isn't a murderer. Like, Dalinar and Kaladin kill hundreds of people. Yes, but that is in war. They, the people who are going up against each other know that they're going in against death. Uh, these three thugs thought that they were going to get a thing. And admittedly... <laughs> not, not like the murderers who were hoping to kill helpless people. Admittedly, the first one dying, perfectly fine. But then slaughtering the other three just to get the... Slaughtering a fleeing enemy. Yes, is very much, I'm just like, no, I'm not, I'm not about that. Also, yes, they're murderers, but the way they died did not sound like anything that anybody should ever deal with. Being forcibly turned into a crystal sounds both horrifying and cruel and unusual. I don't know, maybe that that's the thing is like, I assume that if you get transmorphed into crystal, you just die instantly. Because but, your brain no longer exists to process pain or any information. You're just But for dead. those for those half a seconds beforehand, it is <laughs> nothing but infuriatingly fiery pain, I'm certain of it. <laughs> I, how are you certain of this? Well, uh, imagine turning your entire body to crystal. <laughs> I can't. I, I can't, because it's like... Then even how do you judge mine? My nerves and my brain would be made of crystal, and crystal can't carry the... the I don't know. Yeah. Maybe he. Maybe it's like frozen in stone, except for his eyes, so he could still see things. Yeah, It's. it sounds horrifying. It's one of those things where it's like, I guess I guess neither of us really has any, any way to know, because it's a science fiction-y death. And also, it's a... It's kind of like, oh yes, these slaves are people to be pitied, and these people who are on the streets trying to make their living, admittedly in a horrible way, uh, it, this is so this kind of societal backhand on that one. It's like it's okay, they're murderers. How do you know? <laughs> they are I know that they are currently brandishing knives, but and they, running towards you in a dark alley. In a dark alley, but they could be just trying to intimidate you into giving them money as they could have been doing this millions of times before so that they can get money to pay for food yeah it's again a very it's, societal it, backhand it, it's one of those things though it's like it, it kind of comes with like fantasy territory because mm -hmm. that that's like i'm not willing to to completely brand it as being like utterly and completely immoral because of the society they live in because it's like it's not as though those people would be put on trial mm -hmm. like even if the guards caught them they would kill them immediately or they would capture them to hang them the next morning like there is no such thing as a fair or trial bridge here crew. or bridge crew possible i don't know Kaladin was only put on a bridge crew because he saved the one guy's life mm -hmm. the, the 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 commander would have just assumed killed him well there's also bridge crews are full of slaves and captured prisoners and captured uh, criminals could become slaves. It's a, it's still a thing. It, it it's possible. It, but... it, the foregone conclusion that these people were going to die is not entirely certain, but it does seem that the reasoning that she went out was to slaughter these men, and these men may have just been trying to get money to live, whereas her intent was merely to simply end their lives. Yeah, that implies a lot more malice than the people that were doing it initially. Somewhat. I mean, you don't know that and, and they were trying to do it to live. Hers either. was a cold, calculating mal uh, malice, but it was a malice none nonetheless. Yeah. She did this simply to end the lives of people that, under her morality, are bad. And these other people... <laughs> you put bad in quotes as though, like, they haven't murdered a bunch of innocent people. We don't know that. We don't know they haven't, though. Yes. So there They certainly of... seemed like... That, that's another thing, is they kind of set this up perfectly, where it's like... Look, there's no contesting it. They're at this place where people were killed before. They're coming back. They're coming at us with knives. They're not trying to negotiate. They are clearly the same people who have done this thing before. Mm -hmm. And if they aren't, they are the unluckiest people ever. Yes. But what are the chances of that? That, but it, again, it's also a obvious thing that they've shown throughout this story. That there is a social divide. And the social divide is very noticeable. Like, those with dark eyes are treated like shit. Yeah. And but I still feel like, you know, even if you're desperate for money, there are ways to go about it without killing people. Yes, but again, I 
genuinely did not need this scene to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and it very blatantly feels like we want to show Yasna Colin butchering some people and not feel bad about it. And that's very problematic. See, that's the, to me, it was very clearly, we want to have a, we want to shoehorn a philosophical and ethical discussion in here. So we're going to set up a situation that is super contrived just to make you think about ethics. Mm -hmm. But you were too caught up in the character to look at the the situation and like the moral stuff. Yeah. Whereas to me, I'm like, this is just another example of how Yasna is a prop mm -hmm. to to get across this idea that Shala needs to learn things. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, a lot of things about Yasna are prob are problematic at points. Yeah, it's we you know it, I, I didn't include this on here because I was like. Yeah, we could talk about that whole scene for, like, five hours because that's, like, a a uh, moral and ethical dilemma that's, like, straight out of, like, Any a philosophical textbook. Yeah. It's like, but I don't think that's not really important to the story or anything. I know, but it's just something that irked me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that's probably all going to be cut out, so that's fine. We'll see. But, yeah, moving on to our, our, our last statement. Which has to do with the, the very ending. The thing that, that caught you off the God most. God is guard. dead. <laughs> God is dead and what was his name? Mordok or something? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter they, at they, that point. Well, because the original quote is like, God is dead and we have, have killed, killed him. him. And this is like, and Mordok, the yeah. evil wizard, has killed him. Or the <laughs> evil spren or void bringer mm. or whatever. And now it's up to you to fight the guy who killed God. Good luck. Insert quarters now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I will give you that. It's a it's a hell of a setup. It reminds me of, like, Gurren Lagann, where it's like, you know, you start out as a slave, and you've been tasked with killing the entity that killed your god. Mm. Like, this is going to be one hell of a journey, I tell you what. For me, it feels, uh, I'm more interested in specifically the idea of, like, welcome to a place where they have, take Voronism, this religion based off of the almighty and it is really important about them and this character has been getting visions of from the almighty and he's struggling with his faith and then he gets to the end of it and finds out yeah oh yeah i'm dead yeah and i just want to see that like oh that's it's, just gonna it's, be hard it's for the, the character. most it's the most hookiest hook there is mm -hmm. imagine like yeah, you know, Jesus comes down and says, well, he already did die and then come back. But yes. he's, like, he's like, I have been obliterated, but I am telling you now, and then goes away. How do you deal with that? Like, how? how? What do you got? What do you got to do? I do? I do like the, like, as far as I can tell, the central conceit of Voronism, which is the Voidbringers kicked humanity and God out of heaven mm -hmm. and then tried to take over the earth, and we fought them back. And, and now the point of life is to be good at whatever you do, like to be a good warrior or a good carpenter, because God is building an army in the afterlife to take back heaven, and he needs your help. It's kind of like... It's like, it's like a combination of the monotheistic religions of Earth with like Norse Valhallaism. Mm -hmm. well, it's like instead of the final battle being this, just this thing that sort of happens... It's like, no, Jesus needs your help to take back the throne of God from Satan. God, that means that this entire religion is basically uh, Uncle Sam needs you <laughs> as a fucking religion. Uh, it's just like Jesus on a poster being like, we need you. <laughs> we need you to help take back the, the what do they call it, like the eternal kingdom or something? Yeah, the, the heavenly hell, uh, host. It's just... It has a name, their their version of heaven. I can't remember what it's Buy called. Buy Bibles. I mean war bonds. <laughs> Buy Bible bonds. <laughs> Voronism today. I do. I, I kind of. That, that's one of those things that, um, of all the mysteries that 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 we didn't get, I really wish we got a more in depth view of Voronism because yeah. it seems like a really interesting faith. Like the idea that, what was it? I, I was talking to someone else about it because it seems like what they've done is take a monotheistic religion and add the fantasy elements of a po of polytheism into it. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, you play D&D, &D and there's all these gods, and it's like, I'm the god of fighting, and I'm the god of thievery, and I'm the god of death, or whatever. And you get to choose one to represent you. And in Voronism, basically they had thousands of years, or hundreds of years prior to the story, 
foreignism ruled the world. Mm -hmm. And it was a very bad time. They ruled with an iron fist. And eventually they got the Pope, the foreign Pope got taken down. And they, they found out that... Um, Actually, it was more like the Voronist heralds were very helpful. Then they stopped. And yeah. then, then the people who were in charge of the, the, the worship were like, you know what? We should rule. We should rule everything. And they didn't do well at that. Yeah. But it's as, as a result of the fall of the church, they have some very interesting ideas about how the church should be. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they they're like very taboo for them is predicting the future or interpreting um, the religion in a very specific way because that is what basically the the, the mega church did yeah was they were like our interpretation is the right one we know the future you will follow us now I'm just picturing fantasy Joel Olstein yeah. why so so now what they have is you have the the the, the unified faith of Voronism mm -hmm. but it's split into like, 10 different schools of thought yeah. who all have different ideas about what it means to be good under Voronism. And because no one is allowed to say this is the definite way, they all kind of coexist. Where it's just sort of like, so you have the sect of Voronism that thinks fighting and being a warrior is the most noble one. And you have the sect that is like, no, we're the sect of intelligence and we believe that all the scholars should be getting into heaven. And you have the one, what was it? They were talking about the, the one of mercy that is just like, we're pacifists. You have to be kind. You have to show the almighty's love for everything. And so you, you get basically the polytheistic, all these different versions of God, but it's all the same God. So which one deals with making small committees? Because that's, <laughs> uh, that's basically what Baptists do. And so I might be able to jive a little bit better with that small one. Small committees everywhere. Yeah. Let's make a small committee to decide how many small, small committees commi we should have. You, you make that joke, but that joke has been made so many times for ah, Baptists. Actually, I don't know a whole lot about Baptists. Yeah. The, Either way. We're at, we're at the end of our time. We're at the end of our script. We've talked this about as much as we could. But, you know, let us know what you thought down, down in the comments. Like, did you enjoy this? Would you like us to stay more on topic? Less on topic? And what did you think of the book in general? If you, if you read it as well, did you disagree with our, our points? Next time on Legs Talk About Books for the month of June, we're going to be switching gears. We've done quite a bit of fantasy lately, and I wanted to switch things up with some sci-fi. Mm -hmm. So I put a poll up on the Twitter. Make sure you follow me on Twitter if you want to be involved in polls. And we are either doing Isaac Asimov's Foundation or Ringworld, who I can't remember. the guy, Something Niven, I think. I don't know. Niven. Really. Either way, Ringworld is the one that, that won. It was actually a pretty tight race. We're looking at it right now. Yeah, it's 51.3%. Only a few votes could have changed it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, follow me on Twitter or more likely join me on the Patreon. That's where I, I post the Twitter polls there, obviously. But I also ask for uh, feedback. I ask for questions. I help decide books with the people on the Discord. And you can get there by donating $1 or more to the Hardleg Gaming Patreon. Should be linked down in the description. Used for my main channel, but also for this channel. It's the same Discord. Well, whichever you're interested in. So, uh, yeah. Look forward to that. It's it's if you're if you're un, unfamiliar with it, Ringworld is basically Halo. Mm -hmm. It's Halo from like the seventies, and I that's all I know about it is that it's a world that's shaped like a ring. Okay, I thought it was just something I'd have to give my uh, dog medicine for. No, that's Ringworm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Anyway, until next time, uh, make sure you like and subscribe. Don't be a don't be a airsick wetlander. Lowlander. Fuck. May you find water and... Fuck, that's the wrong book! Uh, I can't remember the things! Uh, Gon Goncho? Gon Goncho is one of them, but that's more of a, hey, how's it going, Goncho? Hey, Goncho. You know, we talked about hooks a lot. Do you know what Goncho means in Spanish? It's what? a Spanish word. What does it mean? It translates to hook. Ah,